Hello students, uh, in today's lecture we will see uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, vindication of the rights of women. So uh, it was in 1792 that all eyes were set in the western world after the insurrection of French Revolution. Wollstonecraft uh, writes about, uh, writes her introduction in response to Talleyrand who had reviewed a new version of French constitution and agrees that girls should be educated with boys but only until the age of 8. A vindication of the rights of women vehemently defends female as full human beings who for several reasons deserve the same education that men receive. Wollstonecraft intends to persuade readers that serious social harm can come from limiting women's mental and moral abilities. Now to begin with the first chapter in which she has taken up the rights and involved duties of mankind considered. In the very first paragraph she says that in the present state of society it appears necessary to go back to the first principles in search of the most simple truths and to dispute with some prevailing prejudice every inch of ground. To clear my way, I must be allowed to ask some plain questions and the answers will probably appear as unequivocal as the axioms on which reasoning is built though when entangled with the various motives of actions they are formally contradicted either by the words or conduct of men. So Wollstonecraft here further moves uh, with the questions that in what does men's preeminence over the brute creation consist? She answers the answer is as clear as that of a half is less than the whole in reason. She further moves on to ask what acquirement exalts one being above another. To which she answers virtue we spontaneously reply. Further she asks for what purpose were the passions implanted. To which she says that men by struggling with them might attain a degree of knowledge denied to the roots. So further she says that consequently the perfection of our nature and capability of happiness must be estimated by the degree of reason, virtue and knowledge that distinguish the individual and direct the laws which bind society and that from the exercise of reason, knowledge and virtue naturally flow is equally undeniable if men can be viewed collectively. She further says that the rights and duties of men thus simplified, it seems almost impertinent to attempt to illustrate truths that appear so incontrovertible. Yet each thing is such deeply rooted prejudice which has clouded reasons and thus various qualities have assumed the name of virtues. That is, it is necessary to pursue the course of reason as it has been perplexed and involved in error by various adventitious circumstances, comparing the simple axiom with casual deviation. She says that men in general seem to employ the reason to justify prejudice, which they have imbibed they cannot trace how rather than to root them out. So the mind must be strong that resolutely forms its own principles for a kind of intellectual cowardice prevailing which makes many men shrink from the task or only do it by halves. Yet the imperfect conclusion thus drawn are frequently very plausible because they are built on partial experience on just though narrow views. So the prevailing thoughts instead of being uprooted by the men are being followed without any second thought. They have not 
acquired those uh, justification or like judgment on the basis of their experience but instead of questioning it they are just following it with their narrow views simples further saying that going back to the principle wise skirts with all its narrative deformity from close investigation but a set of shallow reasoners are always exclaiming that this argument proved too much and that a measure rotten at the core may be expedient thus expediency is continually contrasted in simple principles till truth is lost in a mist of words virtue informs and knowledge rendered a sounding sounding nothing by the species prejudice that assume its name next he says that the society is formed in the wisest uh, wisest manner whose constitution is founded on the nature of men strikes in the abstract every thinking being so forcibly that it looks like presumption to endeavor to bring forward proofs though proofs must be brought or the strong hold of prescription will never be forced by reason yet to urge prescription as an argument to justify the depriving men or women of their natural rights is one of the absurd sophism which daily insult common sense wostonka further says that the civilization of the bulk of people of europe is very partial it may be made a question whether they have acquired any virtue in exchange for innocence equivalent to the misery produced by the vices that have been plastered over unsightedly ignorance and the freedom which has been bartered for splendid slavery men has been held out as independent of his power who made him or as a lawless planet darting from its orbit to steal the celestial fire of reason this argument has been given by wolstone craft and she further says that the vengeance of heaven heaven lurking in the subtle subtle flame sufficiently punished his temerity by introducing evil into the world she says that impressed by this view of the misery and disorder which pervaded society and fatigued with jostling against artificial fools rousseau became enamored of solitude because rousseau was the one who had given his argument to live in solitude because that was being close to the nature according to rousseau and the more we go towards the nature it is the state of nature and the more and uh, the more civilized we are the more we move towards uh, culture we are moving away from the nature so according to rousseau the culture and nature were binary to uh, each other a binary opposite to each other so if we are moving towards culture that means we are moving away from the nature so putting forward uh, the words and obviously her argument against rousseau she says that rousseau became enamored of solitude and being at the same time an optimist he labors with uncommon eloquence to prove that man was naturally a solitary animal misled by his respect for the goodness of god who certainly for what men of sense and feeling can doubt it gave life only to communicate happiness he considers evil as positive and the work of men not uh, being aware that he was exalting one attribute at the expense of other equally necessary to divine perfection so according to wilson crab he reared a false hypothesis rousseau reared a false hypothesis his arguments in favor of a state of nature are plausible Uh, but unsound so she says that i say unsound for to assert that a state of nature is preferable to civilization in all its possible perfection is in other words to arraign supreme wisdom and the paradoxical exclamation that god has made all things right and that evil has been introduced by the creature whom he formed knowing what he formed is as unphilosophical as empires but if to crown the whole there were 
to be rational creatures produced, allowed to rise in excellency by the exercise of powers implanted for that purpose. If benignity itself thought fit to call into existence the creature above the brutes. Wollstonecraft says that who could think and improve himself? Why should that inestimable uh, gift? For a gift it was if men was to create as to have a capacity to rise above the state. That means the state of nature. In which sensation produced brutal ease be called in direct terms a curse. A curse it might be reckoned if all our existence was bounded by our continuations in this world. So this is the argument which she gives against Rousseau's thought or the book that, uh, that was written by Rousseau. For why should the graces function of life give us passion and the power of reflecting only to embitter our days? and inspire us with mistaken notion of dignity. This is the question. Why should he lead us from love of ourselves to the sublime emotion, which the discovery of his wisdom and goodness excites? If these feelings were not in the motion to improve our nature, of which they make a part and render us capable of enjoying a more godlike portion of happiness. So firmly persuaded that no evil exists in the world that God did not design to take place. She says that her beliefs are built up on the perfection of the God. She goes on to attack Rousseau and she again says that true to his first position next to a state of nature, Rousseau celebrates barbarism and apostrophizing the Shade of Fredericius, he forgets that in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis or of extending the reign of virtue. So, eager to support his system, he stigmatizes as vicious very every effort of genius and uttering the apotheosis of savage virtues. He exhausts those two demigods who were scarcely human, the brutal Spartans, who in defiance of justice and gratitude sacrificed in cold blood the slaves that had shown themselves men to rescue their oppressors. So, Boston craft in this part of the text begins with general principles she believes the reader will accept. She identifies reason, virtue and knowledge as the element that distinguish the individual. She acknowledges many flaws in the society of her time including the servile flattery afforded to hereditary honours, riches and monarchy. These things led to philosopher John Jacques Rousseau to condemn society and embrace solitude. Wollstonecraft has strong disagreement with Rousseau. She claims his argument in favor of a state of nature are plausible but unsound. She agrees with his rejection of the artifices of aristocratic society but objects to Rousseau's celebration of savagery. Wollstonecraft also notes that Rousseau does not claim living as savage produces any particular virtues. Rousseau goes against God, uh, she insists, and she prefers to trust in God rather than Rousseau. The solution is the establishment of true civilization, she claims, rather than on Rousseau's idea of society of men in his state of nature. So this is all for today's discussion. Uh, we'll just continue in the next lecture. Thank you.